This is vitamin B1, thiamine, not to be confused with thiamine, the nitrogenous base. It's probably the vitamin that has the most clinical relevance to modern critical care medicine. As you'll see, the deficiency can be devastating, and it's probably more common than we realise. If you look at the chemical structure, it vaguely resembles a purine nucleotide, which will be relevant shortly. The active th form of thiamine is thiamine diphosphate, also known as thiamine pyrophosphate. It can actually undergo some of the same um, enzyme reactions as a nucleotide, such as adenyl kinase. It's also cy cy um, cycled back through thiamine monophosphate to thiamine. Thiamine pyrophosphate can even be transformed to thiamine triphosphate through the ATP synthase, just like ADP can. I'm going to discuss some how thiamine is used on a biochemical level, starting with an overview of um, some basic metabolic processes. If you can see here, there's glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain, ending with ATP synthase. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is an enzyme complex that joins glycolysis and the citric acid cycle. It is the first enzyme that requires thiamine, as well as another coenzyme factor such called lipo lipoic acid. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase is another very similar complex that is part of the citric acid cycle. The next most important enzyme is part of the pentose phosphate pathway, also known as the HMP shunt, which I haven't discussed before. It's a pathway that is used to produce alternative numbered sugars for various uses in the cell. We're starting with a glucose 6-phosphate, which has six carbons, which is convenient um, because the relevant sugars all have a number in the name, which designates how, in this case, how many carbons they have. I've marked those in red. The pentose phosphate pathway has an oxidative and non-oxidative portion. You're probably aware of it because the first step, which is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, this step produces NADPH, which can be used to activate glutathione to deactivate reactive oxygen species. The clinical relevance is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, which causes hemolysis in response to stimuli that cause oxidative stress. There's another couple of steps, including one that creates NADPH um, in the rest of the oxidative pathway. And that can be used for either for oxidative stress reduction or for other cellular purposes that we'll go into later. The next portion is the non-oxidative pathway. Now, if you can look at this small cartoon structure I've put on, um, you can see the five green balls that represent the carbon atoms in the carbon chains. This step, the five carbon sugar diverges into two different five carbon sugars. Ribose 6-phosphate is the basis of nucleic acid synthesis, and it's one of the most important products of this pentose phosphate pathway. In the next step, you have an enzyme called transketolase, which takes the two five carbon sugars and turns them into a three carbon and a seven carbon sugar. Then you have an enzyme called adelase, which swaps one sugar back to form a four carbon sugar and a six carbon sugar. And finally, you take two of those products through transketolase again, and you can swap between five and four carbon sugars to create three and six carbon sugars. Both of those are back in the glycolysis pathway. Now I've made this layout like this so you can see the swaps more clearly, but there's some redundancy as glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate and fructose 6-phosphate occur twice in the pentose phosphate pathway and they're also back in the glycolysis pathway. So we can simplify the whole pathway to look like this. As you can see from this layout, it's a lot clearer that transketolase catalyzes both arms of the pathway and is therefore essential for any movement through both the oxidative and non-oxidative pathways. And transketolase is the enzyme that's dependent on thiamine uh, pyrophosphate, although it's not one of the mitochondrial multi-part dehydrogenase complexes and it doesn't require lipoic acid. And I'm just gonna outline a couple more cellular functions that uh, will be relevant later.
The other main source of NADPH is malic enzyme, which is part of the fatty acid synthesis process. Acetyl-CoA can't diffuse out of the cell, but it can be shuttled out in the form of citrate and then converted back, which produces oxaloacetate and ultimately pyruvate. This consumes an NADH, but produces an NADPH, essentially converting one into the other. This can be used to aid in the synthesis of acetyl-CoA into fatty acids. Acetyl-CoA can also exit the cell, uh, exit the mitochondria, sorry, um, as acetylcarnitine via the carnitine shuttle, which is how the fatty acids get into the mitochondria. Acetyl-CoA is converted into fatty acids, which are essential for myelin production. Acetyl groups are also used for other cellular functions, such as making the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Aside from glucose, many cells can also use fatty acids to make acetyl-CoA and reducing species via beta oxidation. Cells in the CNS cannot use fatty acids, but they can use ketone bodies that are produced from fatty acids in the liver and then converted back into acetyl-CoA. Our last major fuel source is amino acids, such as the branch chain amino acids, which are used by fuel in, as fuel in muscle. This brings us to the last enzyme complex that requires thiamine. The branch chain amino acids valine, leucine, and isoleucine are reversibly deaminated into keto acids, donating their amine groups to glucimate. For them to be cat catabolized, they are then irreversibly decarboxylated and oxidized by the branch chain amino acid dehydrogenase complex before being funneled into either the citric acid cycle or the acetyl-CoA or both. This enzyme also synthesizes propionyl-CoA, which will be relevant in the folate section later. Purely for completeness, I'll also mention that there's one more thiamine pyrophosphate de dependent enzyme, which is hydroxyacyl-CoA lyase found in peroxisomes. It participates in alpha oxidation of long chain fatty acids, specifically phytanic acid, which is derived from plants. It is not especially relevant in thiamine deficiency as it takes many years for the reactants to accumulate. Transketolase, on the other hand, causes major problems when it's in thiamine deficiency, shutting down the pentose phosphate pathway, inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis, as well as NADPH production for reactive oxygen species and for fatty acid synthesis. This inhibits myelin production and causes oxidative stress. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is clearly an essential enzyme for glucose metabolism, impairing in energy production and raising pyruvate and lactate, leading to acidosis in severe cases. Pyruvate can form oxaloacetate even without the PDH, but this is just the starting point for the citric acid cycle. You still need a source of acetyl-CoA for it to proceed. The branch chain complex impairs another source of acetyl-CoA and significantly disrupts amino acid metabolism, particularly through glutamate and leucine. This can be seen in the congenital deficiency of this dehydrogenase enzyme that causes maple syrup urine disease. Inhibition of alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase effectively halts the citric acid cycle and aerobic energy metabolism. It also leads to a buildup of alpha-ketoglutarate. At this point, you might be wondering how any of this is compatible with life, and the answer is that it's not. A severe thiamine deficiency is rapidly fatal, as we'll see. The body cannot live without the citric acid cycle. Some tissues do have ways to bypass this deficiency, for example, in the central nervous system. Alpha-ketoglutarate can form glutamate, which can be shunted through GABA and succinyl semialdehyde to succinate, which skips two se steps forward in the citric acid cycle and allows the cycle to proceed. This does have side effects of generating excess neurotransmitters, as well as nitric oxide via glutamate, which causes uh, oxidative damage. So let's look at some more clinical elements of thiamine deficiency. You might remember the term beriberi from medical school. This comes from the Sinhala language in Sri Lanka 
and means weakness, directly translating as I cannot, I cannot. You might also remember that it comes in two forms, wet and dry. I found this pretty confusing. Why does one disease cause two subtypes? And why do we see it so rarely? And where does Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome come in? The short answer is that it's one deficiency that affects the nervous system and cardiovascular systems, but the symptoms depend on the severity of the deficiency, which determine how quickly it comes on. It's easiest to think of these not as, four, as two syndromes, but as four, two neurological and two cardiovascular. There's a chronic peripheral neurological syndrome called dry beriberi. There's a subacute cardiovascular syndrome called wet beriberi. There's a fulminant cardiovascular and metabolic form called shoshin beriberi. And finally, there's an acute central nervous syndrome uh, called Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. The more severe the deficiency, the more acute the syndrome develops, but there's also some patient factors that influence the outcome. Let's start at the milder, milder stand. Thiamine requirements depend on metabolism, but generally you need 0.5 milligrams per 1000 kilocalories of energy, particularly per energy used uh, derived from carbohydrates. For the average adult, it's recommended that you have at least one milligram per day. Certain enzymes that are found in raw fish or the larvae that are associated with African seasonal ataxia can break down thiamine and prevent its absorption. There's also anti-thiamine factors found in tea and in betel nuts that bind thiamine and prevent its absorption. You can also have malabsorption with various conditions, including with alcohol consumption and after bariatric surgery. Historically, the main cause of beriberi was inadequate intake, particularly after the implementation of a process of polishing rice as a staple food, which removed thiamine from the surrounding husk. The body does not have much in the way of thiamine stores, which last about two weeks. And this is when you might notice the first subclinical symptoms in a mild deficiency. These include anorexia, irritability, depression, and insomnia. If you stay at the threshold of mild deficiency for many weeks, you will start to develop symptoms in the most sensitive tissue, which are peripheral nerves. Nerves are very long cells that have high energy demands to maintain membrane potentials and mostly metabolize glucose, so they are particularly sensitive to bioenergetic deficits. Thiamine is also required for myelin production, and it's thought that thiamine triphosphate may play a role in nerve conduction and membrane potentials, probably as a phosphate donor. Thiamine deficiency in dry berry berry affects the longest nerves first with sensory before motor. So you'll generally see a symmetrical, painful sensory neuropathy affecting the feet with loss of ankle jerk. Over time, this progresses to a glove and stocking distri distribution and ascends with the development of motor weakness. The neuropathy can cause severe disability, but it might stave off progression of thiamine deficiency by reducing the energy expenditure of the patient. While it's usually chronic, a more severe deficiency can cause a more subacute syndrome, which might be the primary presentation if the patient is relatively inactive. It can even resemble Guillain-Barre syndrome in some cases. In addition to the neuropathy, which is often present as well, a more severe deficiency will produce a subacute cardiovascular syndrome called wet beriberi. It starts with global energy dysfunction due to the inhibition of pyruvate and ketoglutarate dehydrogenases. This would usually cause local ischemia, so the physiological response is to release mediators such as adenosine to increase blood flow. Unfortunately, this is happening to the whole body, so instead the patient develops a systemic vasodilatory state. This 
tends to cause a mild decrease in blood pressure, but a huge increase in venous return and cardiac output to con compensate, which causes palpitations and tachycardia. The heart has an extremely robust system of um, energy utilization, but it is impaired by thiamine deficiency. So it will gra gradually develop anatomical changes such as hypertrophy and fibrosis. This is also impaired uh, exacerbated by the neurohormonal reflexes that usually exacerbate heart failure due to other causes. The right side of the heart tends to be affected more and the patient will develop clinical symptoms such as dyspnea on exertion and peripheral edema which is exacerbated by fluid retention by the kidneys. This is the subacute form. The most deadly manifestation of thiamine deficiency is shoshin beriberi from a Japanese term for acute heart failure. It makes up about 5% of cases of beriberi. Shoshin is seen when severe deficiency develops acutely and it progresses over hours to days. It's usually seen in infants to young adults, particularly with high metabolic demands such as physical labor or pregnancy. It's generally not seen with dry beriberi as the nerve lesions force the patient to rest but it can occur on top of the subacute wet syndrome. The pathophysiology is the same as wet beriberi, but more severe. The vasodilatory state progresses to vasoplegic shock. Patients will present hypotensive, which will resemble sepsis. Despite looking hypoperfused, they will still have a very high cardiac output until immediately before death. The energy impairment and pyruvate dehydrogenase inhibition causes a profound lactic acidosis. These patients will routinely have a lactate more than 10 millimoles per liter, often around 15, with a pH of around 7.0. They'll be an extremist with vomiting, tachypnea, and anxiety. The heart failure can decompensate and the patients can also develop pulmonary edema. The end result is multiple organ failure and death. The mortality without thiamine replacement is 100%, although with thiamine it's between 0 and 20%, making it incredibly reversible as a cause of shock if you do recognize it. The treatment is thiamine replacement. Gut absorption of thiamine is saturated after about 4.5 milligrams for one dose, but in Shoshin, due to the vomiting and shock, you'd need to give it intravenously. It might take only 50 to 100 milligrams as an initial IV dose to completely reverse the process. And people tend to see a dramatic clinical improvement within the hours after treatment. Shoshin is the end stage of thiamine deficiency, but most Western doctors are probably more familiar with the acute neurological syndrome, which is Wernicke's encephalopathy. The really interesting thing about Wernicke's is that not everyone gets it. For example, it's almost never seen in pure starvation related thiamine deficiency, and it tends to be more common in alcohol dependence. Looking at the pathophysiology of thiamine deficiency, the brain seems like it should be uniquely sensitive as it has a very high energy requirement, which is primarily glucose dependent. As mentioned before, it does have some redundancy, such as the GABA shunt, which allows the citric acid cycle to continue. Beriberi does feature some CNS symptoms, such as insomnia, lethargy, and depression. So there's obviously some involvement of the CNS, but it doesn't meet the threshold to cause Wernicke syndrome. We'll start by looking at the pathophysiology and then think about why certain patients might get it. We'll start again with pyruvate dehydrogenase failure, which impairs glucose utilization and causes lactic acidosis. Alpha-ketoglutarate inhibition also causes, impairs energy and leads to an accumulation of glutamate, which can cause excitotoxicity and activate nitric oxide synthase. We also have failure of transketolase, which exacerbates oxidative stress and inhibits myelin formation and maintenance. Following this, we have a, an acute vicious cycle of inflammation, oxidative stress and excitotoxicity which cause neuronal dysfunction and ultimately neuron cell death. Like Shoshin Beriberi, 
Wernicke's encephalopathy comes on when there is a, an acute severe thiamine deficiency. But because it typically develops before Shoshin and only in certain people, there must be some reason why their brains are relatively more vulnerable at that time. There are several possible reasons for this. It's been speculated that there is a genetic basis. Transketolase enzymes from subjects with Wernicke's had a 10 times lower efficiency of affinity for thiamine, but there was no sequence difference noted. If there was a difference, for example, in post-translational modification, that could be one factor. Another factor could be the kinetics of thiamine. If transporters into the CNS resulted in low, lower regional concentrations there, it has been speculated that alcohol could play a role, but not everyone with Wernicke's encephalopathy consumes alcohol to excess. The factor that I find most persuasive is a simple metabolic one. If patients are starving, they make ketone bodies, which provide up to 60% of the brain's metabolic requirement. They do not require pyruvate dehydrogenase to use. Carbohydrates stimulate insulin, which shut off ketone production. If there's one thing every doctor's heard about Wernicke's encephalopathy, it's that giving glucose can precipitate it. If a patient is gaining nourishment from beer, for example, they probably have enough carbohydrates to stay out of ketosis. This is why we give thiamine when we're worried about refeeding syndrome as well. Anyway, what do we see as a result of Wernicke's encephalopathy? We see an encephalopathy, obviously, ranging from mild delirium to coma. The structures affected are primarily in the brainstem, including the mammillary bodies, the thalamus, causing memory impairment, cerebellum, causing ataxia, hypothalamus, which can potentially cause temperature disturbance, and cranial nerve nuclei, causing nystagmus and oculomotor palsies. The reason these areas are affected are complex and not fully understood, but they're quite similar to those affected in Lee's syndrome, which is a congenital disorder of brain metabolism. Wernicke's encephalopathy is a medical emergency and it can be fatal or cause permanent brain damage unless treated. This brings us to Korsakoff syndrome. The nomenclature here is a bit varied, but these disorders are now considered a spectrum. Previously, Korsakoff syndrome specifically occurred to the amnesia and neuropsychiatric features of Wernicke's encephalopathy that were seen in the acute or post-acute setting. It's now generally used for the chronic brain injury caused by untreated episodes of Wernicke's encephalopathy, which can include anterograde amnesia with confabulation, as well as more diffuse features such as apathy or even a dementia-like picture. So how do we prevent it? By treating Wernicke's encephalopathy aggressively and supplementing at-risk patients with thiamine. I'll make one further note about thiamine dosing. The body has a store of about 30 milligrams of thiamine in total. So you might wonder why we give massive doses like 300 to 500 milligrams IV three times a day, which we might use for Wernicke's. The issue at hand is present penetration. We need to get the thiamine into the CNS, which generally requires active transport, which takes time. If there's a high concentration gradient, then it can enter the brain through passive processes and potentially reverse the pathophysiology faster, which could save some neural tissue. This was an extract of a longer upcoming video on essential nutrients, part of a series of videos on nutrition. I was planning to wait and release the whole thing, but thiamine turned out to be a massive and very interesting topic. Please subscribe to stay informed of updates and thanks for watching.